Hello and welcome to the ninth episode of Dude Live with um, my co-host Mike Ding Dingfelder. My name is Al Gerdes Matonis, aka Matonis, and we have a special guest today, uh, Mr. Ross Cohen, who's our colleague at the River City Brass. He happens to be playing the first baritone, and um, today is a very interesting topic, which we're going to get into in just a moment. But before we do that. As always, don't forget to like, share, comment. If you have any questions, put them in the chat. Um, uh, we'll try and get as many of them answered uh, at the end of the stream. Um, and that being said, if you have any questions post stream, leave them in the comment section. And uh, with that in mind, um, how are you guys doing? Good. Slow weekend so far. You, but you're forgetting something. Oh, hello, Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> Ross is a little new to this, so he does not know what's happening. Okay, so <laughs> with that in mind, uh, the topic of today is going to be um, an issue that I personally uh, find not often being discussed. Uh, uh, one reason for that is because not, not necessarily too much information about it is uh, publicly available. And second of all, I just find that Personally, from my personal experience, not a lot of people are willing to discuss it who, has, uh, who have first-hand experience. And um, uh, I wanted to introduce um, Ross, who is our colleague. Um, who, um, <laughs> somebody's already uh, chatting that I need to shave. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I'll, keep that in, I'll keep that in mind. Once everything opens, clean shave. <laughs> okay, but with that in mind, um, uh, Ross has a first-hand experience. And... Um, uh, Ross, could you just quickly introduce yourself? So I mentioned that you're you're uh, one of our colleagues at the River City Brass, but you're also uh, a band director. Could you just give everyone a quick introduction uh, introduction of yourself? Uh? Sure. Well, first of all, hi everyone, and, and um, Argadas, thanks for having me on. And, and you're right, there's not a whole lot of people who talk about this, and not a whole lot of information um, publicly available. It's kind of a mysterious thing. So I'm happy to come on and. Um, in, in my limited experience, you know, share, uh, hopefully shed some light on that. Um, but yeah, I've been in the band for, I guess this is the end of what would have been my 13th season mm -hmm. coming up, moved to 2007, um, went to college at Penn State for a music ed degree and then University of Georgia um, for a performance degree. And yeah, like you said, I'm also a band director, I'm a middle school band director right now doing seventh and eighth grade band. Um, and my entire time in Pittsburgh have been teaching in some school in some capacity, uh, doing public school. So, um, uh, yeah, and here I am. Yeah, and um, uh, one, uh, one thing that uh, I, I've received quite a few questions um, in regards to people describing issues that kind of resemble a little bit of a situation that you dealt with that we're going to go into, into detail uh, just in a moment. But uh, I also received a lot of comments um, on my videos uh, in, uh, in regards to our baritone section constantly having different set of uh, players. So, and I, I kind of wanted to avoid talking about that just because um, it's a long story. You don't want to put that in the comment section just with a couple of words. Uh, but I remember when, um, I, I believe it was a little bit over a year ago when I was told that, hey, Ross is, uh, is missing next series. And I, I remember uh, I was asked, um, who, who, uh, who do you think would be a good substitute for him? And um, I remember I asked, uh, is there a particular reason why he's missing? It? And I was told um, that uh, you, you better ask him. It's a, it's a personal um, sensitive issue. So that's, uh, I, yeah. immediately I actually thought of something. Well, it's not that uh, having a focal dystonia is a, is, a, is a great thing, but I thought of something, um, something right. that's pretty, um, pretty bad. And then I called you and you were like, oh, I'm just having this uh, little issue. I need to take a little bit of time you were like oh so um appreciate it appreciate it uh first of all being so open about uh, about this and i'm sure a lot of people would find this uh, extremely useful just because um not uh, not uh, not a lot of people again with first-hand experience are sharing this so how about we just go into timeline so just a quick disclaimer um this is a very uh, this is a very specific topic from um all the, the uh, talk that i had with ross about it so uh 
we're going to start with going through his specific uh, case, which might be uh, uh, different to what other people are experiencing, but uh, we're going to go through uh, his specific case, his specific timeline, and uh, the way he, uh, the measures he took to recover, especially as he got in touch with them. And later on, we're going to try and get a, a little bit more in a general, speak in, in a little bit more of a general uh, sense uh, uh, about the focal dystonia, and then eventually we're going to go to the questions. So if you have any questions specific to focal dystonia, we're going to give priority to those questions, but not exclusivity. And again, just a quick reminder, uh, leave your questions in the chat box. We're going to try and answer as many of them as possible. So uh, Ross, could you just uh, guide us a little bit through that timeline? How did you start noticing um, the issues? When did it when did it start happening? And uh, did you already, uh, how, how long it took you uh, to, to realize that, hey, um, this is this is getting a little serious. I, I need to either take time off or get in touch with somebody. Sure. Um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking it might be more helpful if I actually start with just a definition of focal oh, dystonia. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's good. If you want to... Mm -hmm. Then go back. So, um, yeah. So, um, focal dystonia, as it was defined um, to me by, and I'll throw her name out there now, uh, Jan Kagarais is the woman, the specialist who I've been, I've been recovering with. So, um, my knowledge comes either from her or from, you know, uh, some brief Google searches, uh, you know, as I was going through this. Um, and uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm mostly relying on her expertise. But um, focal dystonia, or the, the medical term is actually the full medical term, task-specific focal dystonia, is a, uh, a learned motor disorder or movement disorder condition, um, the neurological condition, in which an involuntary action gets in the way of a voluntary action. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. So first of all, um, it, it's a learned disorder, right? This is not a genetic thing. This is not something I'm born with. It's not something contagious. This comes about as a result of doing a specific task, the task spe uh, specific dystonia. Um, and in my case, of course, playing a brass instrument. So it's a, it's a movement disorder that is um, you sort of arrive at as a result of doing this specific task. Um, and so the, in, in which a, the, the voluntary action is disturbed by an involuntary one. So I would go to play a brass instrument, and, and I'll go over my symptoms in a minute, but there was an involuntary m movement from my muscles, right, that happened always when, but only when I tried to play a brass instrument. So this doesn't affect me other than playing the instrument, right? It doesn't affect my speech. It doesn't affect eating or anything like that. It's tied to this one action. Um, and it's a neurological disorder, right? So it's not, it's not a muscle problem. So this is not a matter of strengthening the muscles so that they can overcome this or the opposite. It's not a matter of giving the muscles time to relax because they're fatigued. It's not a psychological condition, right? This is not a nervous reaction to stage fright or, or career pressures or anything like that. The problem is from uh, is is in the brain is in the, the the motor signals that the brain sends to the muscles. Is there like a okay, specific so part of the brain? Are you aware of that? Is is it like left side front? Uh, what do you know the part where it happens? Or this? Kind of. Uh, I don't know about left or right. That's a good question. But there are, and, and I'll, I'll get into this later in some of the retraining. In 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 part of the solution to this is addressing which part of the brain these. Um, the signals are sent from in which neurological pathways they go through to get to the muscles. But again, the problem is is in the message sent from the brain. Um, and basically what happens is whatever task you're doing, this is not specific to musicians, but that's of course where you know I, I know it of. But basically in, in doing an action in some kind of inefficient way for such a long period of time or suddenly put into some kind of overly stressful situation, right, that kind of puts enough stress on it that your brain says, we can't do this anymore. And so it starts sending these these errant signals, right, and it, it, we, we won't do that. And so while your conscious mind wants to do one thing, do this action that you've known how to do for however long, right, 25, 30 years, whatever the case is, your brain is sending a conflicting signal that says, no, we're, we're not going to do that. Um, and uh, and so I that, would assume I would assume um, the uh, the the symptoms of that can be uh, can be different from person to person. So somebody by, might be experiencing tremors. Somebody might be experiencing uh, different symptoms. Is that a correct uh, assumption on my end? 
Yes. So, I mean, there are some common ones, but yeah, I, um, uh, different people would, would see different uh, symptoms. So it could be tremors. It could be your whole head shaking. It could be um, the, there's sort of a, a, a pause or a delay when you go to exhale and you kind of you freeze before you go to play. Um, and in my case, so I'll tell you what mine was and then I'll go back and, and then I'll, I'll go through the timeline and what my, my perception was. Um, what my symptoms were is anytime I went to play, my corners, the corners of my embouchure pulled way back into like a pretty significant, like a smile formation. Along with that, my bottom lip curled way under. Yeah, what's and the un yeah, unbeknownst to me until until Jan eventually revealed this to me, my tongue in my mouth also was coming up or, or doing something. Which I, you were not uh, noticing this, is that correct? You, you were not aware of that? Uh, of my tongue, I wasn't. Of some of the other symptoms, not, not quite. But in any event, you could imagine, you know, every time I went to play my horn, um, it, uh, this was my embouchure. So my bottom lip was not involved. So you can imagine that's not going to create a really um, great sound. Yeah. Uh, one sort of interesting characteristic of dystonia, which I understand is very common, is that um, the, these problems occur only in a specific range of the instrument and it's usually right in the cash register so for me it was playing a low b flat to a tuning note b flat a middle school band b flat concert scale was well, that that was where i was having all of these problems making a sound right. i could play way above the half just as well as i always had if not better as i kind of revisited fundamentals i could play way below the staff but to just play a, 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 a eighth grade band tuning note concert f boy that was a struggle so, um, so, but and, and, uh, with all fairness, I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, when they when they told me, I was a little bit surprised uh, because I was not spotting. Because uh, we sit we sit one seat away, and I, I'm curious. Uh, I'm I'm gonna ask Mike in just a moment. But my experience, I thought that when they when they when you told me that hey, I'm having this problem, I thought that that's something like very very minor where you uh, it might be a little concerned. So I'm I'm just skipping one series. Because I could never spot, I, I could hear you play, but I could never spot any any stuff that you were describing. I'm curious, yeah. Mike. Mike, just have you have you ever have you been able to spot uh, like anything uh, uh, in that sense, or because you sit you sit next to? Yeah, I, it, no, I I couldn't notice. I couldn't notice any of those struggles. So where where my ears listen to most often, I, I of course listen to. To you the most because we're sometimes we're reading the same part and things like that. So I'll I'll, I'll listen over and make sure that we're in harmony or, or in unison together. But quite often the the second most person I listen to is is Ross on the on the right hand side of of myself and uh, I've always felt good you know listening over to him and and things like that and, and I, I didn't know of of any of these struggles and yeah yeah it, it, it's it's it came to it's not to put uh, put you on a spot, but the reason why I'm asking is just because I'm sure like neither of us actually spotted that, and that came a right. little bit like a, a as a surprise. So um, let me let me go now answer your question about my perception and the timeline of, of what happened. The short answer to that is yeah, basically I could um, I could I could get through it enough to make a sound and create a pitch. And so sitting in a band of 28 people, or if you were sitting in a band of you know 80 or 100 people. Um, you know, depending on the, the nature of the music at the time, you might you might never know. So if we're playing, you know, uh, you know, a 2D section in the band, no, no one's going to notice. But um, it, it, it was it was a struggle for me and I could feel it, it wasn't right and it wasn't a sound that I really liked. So you might not be able to hear it in the context of things. <clears throat> so my first perception was um, this is a little over a year ago. So it was about the March series of, of last year. So slightly over a year. My first perception was um, everything felt great. But when I played an F, I said that, that just for the fourth line F in the staff, um, it, it was really flat on the horn. You're talking and about maybe, concert F. Con yes, concert F. <laughs> That's very yeah, important. Yeah. Because... <laughs> yeah, concert F. And, <laughs> and maybe an E natural and F, but just those those few notes um i could i could play them and i could get the horn to resonate as well as i always had and my embouchure felt fine but to look on a tuner it would be like a quarter tone or almost a half tone like just way flat and to be uh, but nothing felt wrong 
otherwise. And so it was kind of mysterious. And my first perception, honestly, was that maybe there's a leak in the horn. I actually took my horn to the repair guy here. I said, the horn must be leaking. He looked, he said, no, everything is totally fine. And I noticed when I would play my euphonium or my trombone, like whatever instrument I picked up or buzz the mouthpiece, it, it just, it felt weird. It was always flat. And in order to get it up to pitch, I had to lip it way up. So that was my first perception that went on for a little bit. I actually had um, Sam, one of the other guys in the band, came over. I said, Sam, uh, listen to me play. What's going on? I tried some different mouthpieces. We tried some things. It was just this weird, quirky thing. That um, uh, that phenomenon kind of spread throughout the range over the course of probably the next few weeks or over the spring. Um, and so I spent those few months, March, April, and May of last year, playing in the band. Again, getting through. It's not like um, it's not like I couldn't play my parts. Um, but that got worse and worse. And um, my perception grew from, it went from, it, again, at first it felt fine. It was just really flat. But pretty soon after that, I could tell something was wrong. I didn't know what it was. I did not notice that my corners were pulling back. Although I guess I noticed a little bit, but it didn't, it didn't feel un involuntary. I didn't feel a twitch. Yeah. It just felt weak. And I could tell in the mouthpiece, the buzz was very dead. It felt like... Um, uh, again, it almost felt like the horn was leaking, like if you were playing with, like you had removed the tuning slide or, or that you were just like, I had shoved my mouthpiece into a brick. Like I could make a sound happen, but I had to really, really force it. And it almost, I could tell something was going on with my lips that weren't, they weren't vibrating, but again, you can't see. So I couldn't yet describe what was happening with my lower lip, that, that yep. pull back. You can imagine... Right. If, if that's yeah, how you're that's trying. A, that's that's one yeah. of the things. That's one of the things I always uh, teach because that normally, uh, in your case, it's a little bit different. But that's a big problem in upper register. It's uh, that's uh, that's what I always uh, tell that uh, make sure that you strengthen the muscle so the bottom lip does not start slipping under the top lip. Now, Mike, uh, you wanted to. Yeah, yeah I just had a I just had a question as you were explaining all of that. Were, were those some were those symptoms that you were explaining? Was that something that was happening constantly? Did that happen just every so often, or or what, while you were within that range, that whole time it would be a consistent problem? Within that range, it once it started, it was there one hundred percent of the time. So to be clear, this is this was decidedly different, noticeably different to me. And um, the the definition of this this dystonia is it is not the same as like you know brass players have good days and bad days, right? Your chops feel good or they feel tired, right? It wasn't like ah oh, I didn't get a good warm up in today, so it feels a little funny, or it wasn't oh, a week of really hard concerts, I need to take a day off. It was well, because I would take some days off. I would take time off. I would make sure to warm up well. Um, as this rolled into the summer, I wound up taking a few weeks off to see if it would just go away. Every time I played anywhere in that register, and it was kind of worse, right? Again, worse. That was kind of the epicenter of it was a contra def. But every day I played my horn and every note in that register felt weird. Um, and one more way to describe what it felt like for me was... It's almost like if you imagine you take like two magnets that are whatever the same, uh, you know, the same pole and you try to put the magnets together and they 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 absolutely won't go. You can push as hard as you want, but but physics and nature are not allowing those magnets to go together. This was an involuntary motion. It's not like it's not like I could say, oh, that that feels kind of weird. Let me try this other thing with my embouchure. Let me see if I can move my lip out more, move it up more. It, this was out of my control, and um, there was there was no there was no changing it. And and uh, but you mentioned it, that happened around uh, March series. So I'm just curious, like, is is that? And uh, I know it's probably different from case to case, but is that something? Because it does not sound to me like a problem that just happens overnight. But you, it, it didn't happen overnight. Like I said, it started just with a couple notes, and it just felt flat. But it, so I couldn't tell you how quickly it it spread, so to speak. You know, a week, a few weeks, a month. But but by the end of the March series that we played, or certainly by the April series, it it had set in, um, pretty consistently. It was it it was pretty noticeable. And what was the point where you said, uh, okay? <laughs> I need to I need to figure something out because this is not good. Yeah. So the more this dragged on, the more it kind of became frustrating and the more I started to at least think to myself internally, okay, I something is wrong. 
I don't know how to fix it. I don't know what this is. This is never something I've dealt with before, nor something I've really heard of before. I need to do some kind of research or, or find somebody who could help me. Um, I didn't really have time during the school year, both because of the brass band concerts and because of the school year. Um, and then I, I wound up with one more concert engagement at the end of June um, that I was preparing for that probably delayed my, uh, my help a little bit. But it's somewhere in there, uh, you know, and uh, I, I had heard of focal dystonia and I knew it was a thing that could either end careers. I also knew that there were people who had it and recovered from it, but I knew it was it was a significant problem that I didn't want to have. But I started Googling it. And at some point I said, is this focal dystonia? And I tried to look up symptoms. Um, I tried to look up examples. Um, and, and that started to set in last um and then in July, I went actually and played for Lance LeDuc. And I said, hey, man, I think I think something is going on. And he said, yeah, probably something's going on. And he was the one who pointed me in the direction of Jan Kagarais, um, who I had I had heard of before. I had never met her before. I didn't know anything about her teaching, but I knew that um, she was known as um, probably, and this has been confirmed, probably the world expert on how to treat focal dystonia, at least for brass musicians. Um, so it, it took a few months of just trying to deal with it. Um, it also, you know, when I had more time after the season and I was just home all day, could practice, I really kind of revisited fundamentals. And I think this is pretty common for all of us. If we have problems, we go, you know, we go back to playing Schlossberg and Arbenz and we go back to doing, you know, the things that, that, that we know how to do. Um, and it <laughs> this was the ironic thing. And in, in revisiting all of those things, again, uh, my high range felt, great my low range felt great i would take out the rochu book or what you know some kind of lyrical etudes i would play them up an octave i would play them down an octave sounded great felt better than ever playing them as written in the staff was it was it felt like dragging bricks along the ground i mean this just was not gonna go um and so eventually i said all right this is this is this could be dystonia it 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 was difficult to find information online. There isn't a lot of it. In Agardas, you were exactly right at the beginning. And so thanks again for offering to do this. I hope this is helpful for some people. But it is, um, it's not something that a lot of people want to talk about because if you're a successful professional musician, right, you're, and your livelihood comes from playing in an orchestra or a professional band or whatever it is, and or from your reputation and getting booked for other gigs or teaching engagements, right? You don't want to broadcast to the world that you're having some kind of issues, right? An athlete doesn't want to tell everyone that they have, you know, shoulder problems if yeah. you're playing quarterback. You, So um, I knew also that whenever people did go to, to, you know, for their recovery, that it was often confidential, right? So I, I and, you know, names leak out every once in a while because they choose to go public and, and say, I had dystonia or I have dystonia, I have to retire. But um, I know a lot of the clients that Jan sees um, I, I don't know who they are. She has to be confidential about that, and um, for good reason. And, and I understand that. The, the downside, of course, is that if you have it, there's not a whole lot of information about it or or how to fix it. So the yeah. information was very very limited. Because I, I get I get kids, you know, t t t sending me messages, and they describe and and you obviously you have a you have some miles on your playing so i guess if it, if it would make sense uh, that it would happen to somebody i would assume it probably w would be something more likely to to come for a, a little bit of older players or at least somebody who has some miles i'll keep on getting uh, kids uh, who describe issues which again it's hard to tell whether that's a psychological thing because sometimes the symptoms i would assume are kind of they, they might have some similarities but th sometimes the, the way they describe it and the problem that you cannot uh, you cannot find uh, any information. And um, I know because I kind of when you were away, I kind of told you a, a little story where I, I hit my face with a mouthpiece that actually happened. Uh, another, I don't know whether I told you, but man, it's devastating. I could not like play play uh, for me. The, the most important it's, it's a very um, it's a very uh, put you in a very powerless, uh, powerless situation where it's uh, not even like how much you practice or try. And um, I was just um, I could only imagine that um, dealing with this emotionally as well. It's not uh, not probably <laughs> the greatest, obviously. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, I was, I was going to ask you, like, what uh, 
what was the psychological impact that this had on you before you started to recover? Like what was going through your head mentally? And can you de- describe what, what your feelings and thoughts were? It was um, difficult, obviously, and the reality of what this might be and did turn out to be kind of slowly set in. And again, I kept it to myself for a while. As I, I, I remember actually being very hesitant to even Google the term focal dystonia because it was almost like admitting to myself that like, okay, this is, this is real. Um, but uh, also from the beginning, I, there were two kind of silver linings for me. One was that, um, first of all, I don't have uh, my, my livelihood, right? My mortgage is not dependent on the brass band income, right? I'm, I'm glad to get the paychecks we get and it's wonderful and I'm appreciative and it's helpful. But if, in, in a worst case scenario where this was um, uncurable and I could never play my instrument again, I'm still putting a roof over my head, right? My livelihood isn't going anywhere. And also I don't have, um, you know, I don't have the, the reputation of being, you know, the principal trumpet player of some, you know, world renowned orchestra that has to like, oh my goodness, like people around the world expect me to be the best trumpet player, you know, ever. And now I can't even play a, a tuning note. And so I didn't have that pressure facing me so that that was helpful for me. Um, of course, it was uh, daunting to think that maybe this, uh, you know, the, the, my playing career was going to go away or even, you know, even it feels weird sometimes to play in class for middle school students because things that are supposed to come out sounding really good, like um, there was still some difficulty there. Um, but those those were two. Or, that was one silver lining. The other is that. Um, I figured if I could recover, right, that this would actually be quite liberating for me, and that's what I found it to be, and that um, as we'll start talking soon about the, the recovery and how to go about that, you know, in learning to play more efficiently or just sort of re, um, retraining, uh, you know, when I finally get to the end of this on the other side, it should actually feel much easier than it did before. Um, and I'm sure what brought this about was that for whatever I've been able to do well on the euphonium or baritone or whatever, um, no one ever said like, oh, listen to Ross Cohen play his horn. That's, he makes it sound so easy. That was, that was never my strength, right? So to, um, I had a lot of amazing teachers help me get my tone and my sound to the point where it was, you know, acceptable. And there were, you know, a lot of good qualities to it, I think. Um, but ease of playing was never one of them. Uh, and um, from literally the first day I signed up for band in fourth grade and took the trumpet out of the case, um, my beginning band teacher told everyone, he said, go home for a week, buzz the mouthpiece, and try to play some songs. And he said, in order to, um, in order to play higher, buzz tighter, right? Which I think was, it, in one generation, that was, that was, that was the, the presiding pedagogy. And it kind of works, but I, I don't think I was ever able to to get away from that as much as, um, you know, pedagogy now is all based on air and keeping this as relaxed as possible. I, I was able to get better and better and better and better at that, but I never got a, a fully got away from that. And so I think um, that was hard. And then to, to play for so long in, you know, a brass band is a rigorous book i mean the two hour concerts it's a lot of notes it's a lot of loud playing it's a lot of concerts in a month a lot of concerts throughout the year um and again as as i was able to get better and better i just was never able to fully get away from some kind of more stress here than was necessary so um yeah Yeah. i'm i'm it feels better and better as I'm learning this and feels easier and easier now. And, and I, and now, uh, as you're saying, I remember, I don't know whether you recall, but we had one concert um, in Ohio, I, I believe, where we were carpooling me and you. And I remember we were talking about specifically high register. And I remember the way you were, de- you were describing how you get to, to high notes exactly like that. And I was like, really? No, 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 yeah. no way. I was like, hmm, that's interesting. That's not, not how yeah. I, uh, not how I normally, uh, do it. Cause we were talking about the space aperture. Of, that's how, that's what, what I'm trying to always focus on. So that's interesting. Yeah. Now, um, uh, that Jan, the lady you were talking about, 
Uh, we're going to go into the interaction. Before we do that, just a quick reminder. If you want any questions answered, or at least to our best knowledge on the focal dystonia, leave them in the chat. We're going to leave a little bit of time at the end of the stream to, to get some of your questions uh, answered. Or if you have an experience and you like to share, uh, put them in the chat room. Uh, I'll try and get them answered. Um, and uh, you mentioned the specialist that Lance uh, recommended you was a lady by the name of Jan. And what was the surname, Jan? Um, Kagaris, mm -hmm. uh, K-A-G-A-R-I-C-E, um, and again, I had I had heard of Jan and, and knew of her expertise in this area, but I didn't know much, uh, I didn't know anything about her her um, her training. Um, but Jan was for a long time. I don't know exactly what year. She was one of the trombone professors at the University of North Texas, um, and uh, has I don't know when she left UNT somewhat recently, but she now. Um, lives in uh, Chautauqua, New York, Western New York, um, and uh, this is what she does now. And she sees all of her clients online. She has clients from around the world um, who uh, she never tells me names, but she'll tell you know she has a principal trumpet in some major orchestra here and principal horn you know player. And, and so she won't tell me who they are, but these are world-renowned professionals are seeing her for advice um, and. Uh, yeah, she's been wonderful. I've never actually met her in person because all the lessons were on uh, FaceTime or Skype even before the pandemic started. Um, so that's uh, that's been kind of interesting. But I've so, you know so, I've seen her for two to three weeks. So tell me, you got in touch with her, and uh, she obviously said that yeah, I'll be able to help you. I would assume the first the first uh, the first uh, encounter was about determining whether that's actually uh, the the problem we're, we're looking at. So can can you just um, uh, share a little bit of experience uh, on uh, how did the, that particular first session uh, went? Uh, what did she say? Uh, what was your reaction and uh, what was the plan uh, going onwards? Sure. So um, she does what she calls an initial consult. Um, and she, she really has this whole thing down to a sign. So, um, you know, we kind of set up a date. Um, I got online. I played through an etude for her. Um, and she immediately said, okay. And she had me do a couple things, but she, she said to me, okay, I know exactly what your problem is, and I know exactly how to fix it. Um, and so that was immediately a big relief. Um, and then, uh, um, I you know, for I think her, her clients, what she does is then kind of lay out the whole thing about what dystonia is, right? So what I described at the beginning, she basically explained uh, to me, um, and and um, the kind of lays out her her broad plan for how to go forward. And then you know, lessons after that are very specific for every person, uh, of course. And so everyone has different symptoms, and I'm sure she has a different game plan for everybody. Um, but that was that was the initial consult. She confirmed what the problem was. Um, for me, luckily, she said I, I, I had caught this early. Uh, I was concerned I had let this go way too long. Um, um, but luckily, I caught it early enough, um, and we got to work. OK, and uh, and could you describe me, could you describe us? So she, she, she knew particularly what was your case. I, I would assume that probably comes from uh, seeing multiple cases so did she mention how often uh, how often this happened and what exactly the problem was and uh how often it happened or how often she yeah yeah how often she sees that that's what i meant yeah uh you mean like how many people she sees yeah, no 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 she she obviously knew particularly uh, how, what your case was and what was happening so my assumption would be that she probably seen enough of uh, these similar type of cases uh so I'm just curious, how, how did she describe this issue and uh, what kind of, uh, uh, how often, uh, how often did she prescribe uh, those meetings? What kind of exercises in particular? Uh, what kind of, because um, I would assume she, she gave you a very uh, rational, scientific based explanation of what is happening, particularly in your case, the way you've been describing what's happening with your corners, with your tongue. That's obviously uh, something I would assume was brought, brought on by, by her. Uh, by by her noticing and, and knowing what's normally happening. So can you just elaborate right. a little bit more on, on the specifics of your case? Well, you obviously you elaborated what happened, but uh, in terms of what was the what was the path you you you, you both determined would be a, a good path to recovery? Yeah, sure. So um, 
first of all, I, I can't say enough about Jan and working with her. It's been um, very encouraging. She's um, very upbeat and positive, which I think she has to be, um, given the, the nature of the condition that she's trying to, to treat and the people she sees. Um, she Her approach is clinical. If I had to say it in a word, it is very clinical. And you're right, Al Gadas, she uh, what I was presenting was nothing she hadn't seen before and probably dozens, if not hundreds, of other clients. Um, so she is able to very, very meticulously approach, uh, you know, I can see it with me, obviously, my my symptoms and attack them in, in you know, a particular order and in various ways. And I'm sure she does the same for other people, depending on their symptoms and their um, and their situation. So um, it and yes, her approach is in the the language she uses and the words she uses is is it's scientific right in terms of the like the neuroscience of what the brain does and her understanding of that and what the exercises um are meant to address and how the exercises um uh kind of remap these signals in your brain um and uh, it's just extremely clinical it's very scientific in a way that i've never really seen any other music teacher teach. And of course, she's, you know, I'm going to her for this specific thing. So it's not like we play etudes and excerpts and she's giving me musical advice. I'm sure she's fabulous at that. But, you know, I go to her for this very um, specific thing. Um, I did, I, you know, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just just curious. Are are you able to give uh, like one example of you're having an issue with one thing? This is one example of something that she, uh, an exercise she gave to me to help with that specific concern. Yeah. So let me, let me try to explain that as best as I, I can. And first of all, I did Algardas when you invited me on, I, by coincidence, I was going to see her the next day anyway. And I asked her about this and I said, you know, what, if I go on and kind of describe this to people, you know, to the masses, what, what is helpful versus what is not helpful. Um, and so I, I did kind of talk with her a little bit about what to say and not that any of it is secretive, but if it's, it's complicated because if you're not having these problems, right, it might not be helpful for you to hear like, Oh, here's this other approach you could try because that could actually lead you to problems. So if what you're doing is working and you have a successful professional career, or you're a successful student and you like the way you sound, then it could be, it could, in fact, be damaging to then suddenly try to approach the instrument I, differently. I, I would, I would really struggle to imagine somebody would try to change something if they're sounding good. I think that there's a problem. The problem, I think, uh, what will be a, a more um, not necessarily relevant but important thing is um, how do you determine? Like, uh, how how do you know whether it's nerves, uh, your your uh, whether it's a psychological issue? Or it's a neurolog because a neurological. I'm not pronouncing that correct. Neuro neuro. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> That's what Brain. you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, language yeah. barrier. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think she can see the symptoms, and again, she's seen them before, so she says, okay, that that is focal dystonia. That is, and um, she probably sees clients who she says, no, this is not dystonia. This is another thing. But um, in any event, let me let me try to sort of. Um, broadly lay out her her approach um, in a way that I think would be helpful in the sort of basic categories. Um, So first of all, what she winds up doing is essentially rewiring the brain and remapping the motor signals that your brain is sending to your embouchure, right, to begin with. So that, um, again, if the dystonia is now that this, this pathway in the brain is damaged, it can't be used anymore. So if you go to do this action, the, then this uh, this involuntary action is going to interfere, and so you cannot use that pathway anymore. So what she has to do is basically train your brain to send the motor signals uh, down a different pathway, right? Get them to get your brain essentially to do a different action. Um, and either, um, you know, the analogy would be like a you know a, a disk on a computer, or the hard drive on a computer. Either unplug that altogether so that that dystonic signal is not even uh, um, the, the, the signals aren't going down that pathway anymore or uh, overwrite that so your brain learns a new habit basically so everything she does is intended to um send these motor signals down different pathways um she everything she teaches is about efficiency right is kind of the theme and getting 
getting your body to do things as naturally as they can and as efficiently as they can. So um, efficiency and respiratory function. Um, and again, I, I discussed this with Jan and what would be helpful to talk about, but the first thing she suggests is that the idea of um, when you breathe, the exhale is the action that you're doing. Okay, the inhale is not an equal action. They're not two equal things, but the inhale is something you do to set up the exhale in the way or the analogy she uses is like you're playing tennis. Okay, if you're playing tennis, the forswing is the action that your brain is thinking about. That's what you're doing. The, the backswing, right, bringing the racket back is not an equal action. It's just something your brain does to set up swinging the racket forward. If you are, um, if you are playing baseball, if you go to field the ground ball, you don't say, okay, I got the ball, now I need to bring my hand back, and now I need to bring it forward. You pick up the ball and you say, I need to throw the ball forward. And of course your hand has to go back, but your brain does that as a, um, as a reflex based on the action that it's going to do, which is to move that's, forward. That's so, so, so interesting to hear because, I, in fact, today I was, I was having a lesson with somebody. And uh, it's, it's funny because that, that, that analogy, the, the approach, but I was teaching the, the same thing. I was talking about inhale and exhale being two very different uh, kind of motions where one of them, you're, I'm, when, when inhaling, I'm thinking relax. When exhale, I'm thinking energy and power. So, and it's, it's normally uh, the problem that happens is when people get stuck in one motion, it's either they always stay relaxed and very passive with the way they play or very tight and, and, and they struggle with breathing. So it's, it's fascinating. I, I, it kind of, you get a little confirmation bias that actually uh, unconsciously you, you realize those things as well. It's just fascinating because yep. I've never heard an approach with... Uh, uh, so I think what's, what's interesting and what his, the, the sort of neurology behind this is, first of all, everything she does is very much in line with Alexander Technique, which I've also been taking Alexander Technique lessons, um, which in a nutshell is basically um, getting your body to move or do things uh, as efficiently as possible in as natural a way as possible. Alexander Technique is about getting your brain to understand how your body wants to work in a natural way so that you don't do anything stressful or you don't do anything extra, you don't do anything unnatural. That could be breathing, that could be standing and walking, it could be sitting, it could be the act of standing up or sitting down, the act of holding the instrument. What, what is the most natural way for your body to do things? And what I've learned through that and through Jan is, is again, it's so, you know, the analogy of tennis, it sounds like, okay, fine, an analogy, whatever, exhaling is the action and inhaling is a reaction, who cares? But your brain, there, Mike, you asked, or Algardas, you asked about parts of the brain. So this is sort of something that has resonated with me <clears throat> a lot. Um, there are obviously lots of parts of your brain, but there are two parts that can control an action that you do, right? <clears throat> um, and I'll skip the scientific name, but basically the front brain and the, 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 um, the rear brain, the hind brain, yeah. right? Your conscious brain is where you say, okay, I want, to, I want to make a fist. And you know how to do this, and I can close my fingers and make a fist. And that's one way to do that. If you want to punch a punching bag, right, or punch someone, your conscious brain knows that you want your hand to go here. And meanwhile, your unconscious brain, right, or the, um, there's a, uh, an Alexander teacher whose name I want to make sure I get right here, um, who wrote an article and explained this, um, Missy Vineyard Airgood. Right, calls this sort of that the subconscious brain your helper, right? And there's a whole system there, and there's a whole neurological name for it. But right, this other part of your brain can subconsciously calculate things and and can also trigger motion. So I can either make a fist by saying I want to make a fist, or I can punch a punching bag, and this that mm -hmm. helper that part of the brain, right as a result, the act of the act of doing something while your brain is focused on something else is a more efficient way for your brain to calculate that. And I would assume, okay. I would assume that the, 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 uh, the conscious one, well, not the conscious, but the, 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 the one that is, is secondary is the rear. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because somebody mentioned in the chat when I asked about the, the, which brain uh, side does it cause, somebody uh, started putting that behind the brain, that focal dystonia. Yeah. Behind brain. And so... What sounds like, okay, an analogy to tennis, yeah, okay, four swing, back swing, exhale, inhale, what, you know, you can call one an action and what, but that's now coming from a different part of your brain. So if, 
if you're focused on the exhale while you are inhaling, that's your rear brain is in a much more efficient way is doing the inhaling for you because it knows you want to exhale consciously. If you do that on your own, right? You can, of course, you still have to inhale, but now it's coming from a different part of your, of your yeah, brain. If you, I'm trying to think of another analogy, analogy. If you go to open a door, right? Right. You don't, as you walk, as you approach the door, you don't say, okay, I need to stick out my hand about two feet and about, you know, three and a half feet off the ground. You say, okay, there's, there's a handle to the door and, and your hand <clears throat> goes up. So there's, um, that, that is a, that's a big part of this. And the language can sound like it's not making a huge difference, but in, inside your brain, it is making a big difference. And that's part of the thing that, that routes the signals around that dystonic pathway. Yeah, that's interesting. And, uh, and it's actually, uh, for me personally, it actually makes a lot of sense. Now, what I'm curious, this is obviously a neurological, I cannot pronounce that word no matter what. Never mind. But you know what I mean? Issue. But the, the treatment yeah. sounds like it's, it's a bit of a psychological treatment because if it's about rewiring your brain, so you obviously have to refocus instead of uh, primarily putting the emphasis on the inhale, you're focusing on the exhale. So that sounds like a psychological training. The cure, the cure to neurological problem is a psychological training. Is that, is that the correct assumption or not, not exactly? No, I think it, it's not psychological. Psychological would be like how, how you feel, right? Like how your emotions, but it, so it, it is um, physiological, I think, but it's yeah. neurological. So, um, and, and almost in an athletic way. Um, the other, so, and then that applies in sort of these, these other um, pillars of, of the recovery. So that's one of them is, is breathing in an efficient way, right? And of course, if you can do that easier, it's easier on your whole body. Um, the, other is, and these two kind of go hand in hand. Um, so the idea that instead of creating a buzz in the mouthpiece, instead of buzzing the mouthpiece, you are blowing through the mouthpiece into the horn, right? And the physics of the instrument being that the air in the horn, if you get, um, if, if you blow into the horn and you energize the air, uh, the air column that's in the horn, right? That starts to resonate to the bell and back, and then your lips respond to that. And um, that could be opening a can of worms because I know there's you, there could be debate among yeah, yeah, you know yeah. brass players, doctors. Do you buzz the mouthpiece or do you blow through it? And as Jan explains, that it's not a debate so much or different philosophies, but it's two different applications of physics. Yeah. Um, and again, not to to not to promote one over the other, but if you know, I spent all of my career like most brass players around the world, including the best brass players in the world, buzzing the mouthpiece. If that's now a dystonic action for me, my brain cannot do that anymore. So I have no choice but to, instead of buzz the mouthpiece, blow through the mouthpiece and allow my lips to respond and buzz by responding to the the air resistance that's inside the horn. So they can both work. You could be, you know, a great professional doing, you know, e either one. But if one is dystonic for you, then, you know, you have to get the other one. And that feels more efficient to me. That feels easier that my lips, my embouchure is now responding to what the air is doing in the horn mm -hmm. rather than me something now and, and so I'm, I'm just curious because um uh, first of all uh and i know we kind of discussed this before streaming that um there's certain specifics you want to avoid mentioning just not to confuse not not necessarily not to reveal anything but not to confuse right. people so or s certain questions so i'm, I'm what i'm going to try and do is get as much specifics from you as possible if at some point you feel like uh, hey I, i'm not necessarily feeling this is beneficial uh information uh, l let us know but i'm gonna keep on pushing you because i know what i kind of get a good idea of what your goals are with with that i need to make sure to rewire your brain but i'm not personally getting uh, enough specifics of how to achieve that and i'm i'm really curious uh, uh curious whether it's possible to get into the, uh, a little bit more in depth into those but just before we do that i saw mike mike smiling and i that normally that smile i recognize that smile because it only it only comes at around 40 to 50 minute mark when <laughs> it, t today it's es especially uh you know powerful when we're talking about such you know important subjects and, and things like that and, and stuff with the brain and i just get you know when when things get so serious i just get really really hungry <laughs> and 
I always have a snack because, you know, when Al throws a question out there and stuff like that, you know, it's a really good question, but these questions are like excellent and you're saying so many great things and, and it's just like even more so today. So I had to bust out my snack, but on, on a lighter note, even though Al can't say the word neurological, it's actually, he's actually, you might not know this, Ross, but he is actually a brain specialist. He has actually discovered a new muscle in the brain. It's called the willpower muscle. So you're talking to a pro here. Okay. Uh, by the way, while, while, you're, while you're getting some uh, sugar energy for your brain... To, to keep on having the stream. Like, it kind of looks like a brain a little bit. A little I bit, have, but it's all sugar. It's all sugar. Willpower so don't muscle, get it confused with the brain. <laughs> the, will, the, willpower, the willpower muscle is right about here. <laughs> have you, Ross, have you heard about willpower muscle? I In front of not. the brain? There's, does it, look, does this, does this sound like something that would make sense to you that there's a part of the brain that is responsible for willpower and ability to make decisions whenever you're tired and make, uh, it doesn't seem uh, like you're right. Uh, I wouldn't know. Yeah. It sounds the most totally made up thing ever. He starts talking about a willpower muscle. I dare you. Muscle. I dare you Google that. That being said, there, eat your, coo there, eat your cookie. Hold, eat your hold cookie. Hold on. Hold on one second. Are there even muscles in the brain or is it just an organ? No, they, they refer to a willpower muscle. It's not a muscle. It's a part of a brain. I explained that exclusively in the last live stream. That being said, <laughs> back, to, back to the topic. Yeah. You, you got yourself so, a five-minute rest zone. Let's go. <laughs> Al Gadassi, let me, let me keep explaining a little bit and then go to your questions because they're so yeah. to connect that to some other things. So first of all, I'm, I'm now learning to, to blow through the mouthpiece and blow into the instrument rather than buzz the mouthpiece. So that in and of itself is... Uh, rewiring the brain because now it's a totally different action, right? When I pick up the horn, I'm no longer doing that action that I had been doing before that's now dystonic. Part of my training is to be able to to blow through the mouthpiece without my lips trying to close up and, and buzz. And as that gets better and better, then my, my tone as I work on it gets better and better. The other big uh, sort of aspect of this is that um, Jan talks about your, your focus of attention, which is also part of Alexander technique, meaning where physically is your brain focused as you're playing the horn. So now I, I, part of my training has been to move my focus of attention, meaning, okay, what are my, uh, uh, what does it feel like in the mouthpiece, right? To what does it feel like in the instrument? What does the air feel like in the horn? And while I'm feeling that through my lips, the point at which my brain is receiving feedback and kind of getting sensory signals from is resistance inside the instrument instead of inside the mouthpiece. So that also applies to Alexander Technique and other just sort of everyday things in the way you move your body. For instance, um, uh, if, you're, if you're using a knife, right? If you're cutting food with a knife, cutting vegetables, Yes, your hand on the handle of the knife is a part of your body that feels that, but your brain is focused on the end of the knife as it goes, as it goes through the food, right? You're feeling resistance at the end of the knife. Jan talks about um, skis. I don't ski, but if you're skiing, if you're, feeling, um, if you're feeling the ground at the end of the skis, your brain is receiving feedback and helping you balance and, and maneuver over the terrain. It's using the skis as an extension of your body. It understands the skis as an extension of your body. If your brain is focused on your feet, then the skis just become this piece of wood that's not helping you at all. Um, if you're, um, if you're, you know, writing with a pencil, as I try to describe this to my students, you're, yes, it's your fingers that are, that are feeling the vibrations as the pencil hits the desk or whatever, but your brain is focused on the, the point of the pencil. So the idea that your, your, your brain using an external focus of attention, right, meaning something at the edge of this tool or the end of the tool, Jan talks about a blind person walking with a cane. Okay, they, they're, yes, their hand is the part of their body that feels the vibrations, but their brain is thinking about the end of the cane on the floor, right, and getting information from there. Your brain can calculate these tools as an extension of your body. It's part of your brain's body map. 
Okay, this all has to do with with sending motor signals and receiving sensory feedback from around. Um, this is your proprioception, your brain's ability to um, perceive the space around you. So by moving my brain's focus of attention to inside the horn rather than inside the mouthpiece, my brain is now calculating the instrument as as an extension of my body. This has become part of my brain's body map. All of this is based on Alexander technique. And just to throw out the one other, um, the, the name of the, the researcher or scientist, um, uh, Gabrielle Wolf, W-U-L-F, is someone that Jan references Yeah, and I think lot. what we're going to do, so, sorry, sorry for um, uh, uh, disrupting you, but I think uh, what, what would be a good idea, if you could send me uh, later on these links, I'm going to put them in the comments section so people can find uh, the names or the articles you're referring. So I think that yes. would be helpful. So later on, uh, once this video is uploaded, um, uh, you'll be able to find uh, you'll be able to find those links in the comment section. I'll make sure that they appear there. So just to kind of wrap up, because those were the three big things, right? All of my retraining has been about breathing efficiently, right? By by the exhale being the action, while the inhale is a uh, is a reaction to that, even though the inhale happens first, it's a reaction to what will happen. So efficient breathing, right? Blowing into the horn rather than buzzing the mouthpiece and the focus of attention being on the resistance inside the horn rather than what do your lips feel like so that this is now part of your brain's body map. And all of that is is remapping these signals that are going to and coming from my brain. And of course, all of that, then the breathing is dictated then by the phrase that you want to play. So it's not, it, it's not that you're forgetting about the music at all, right? All of these actions are dictated by the phrase, but it's kind of filling in these various um, uh, motor processes that, that allow the brain to then rewire basically around this, this sonic signal. All right. And uh, again, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push you a little bit more into specifics. So and I, for me, a lot of it makes sense. And, and as you're saying, I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm rethinking of the way I approach it. And a lot of it is uh, something I do unconsciously as well, because um, what you mentioned is, is it's very good. Uh, and that's something I always try to encourage people to rationalize. It's just tricky rationalizing if you don't know what you're looking for. Now, you're mentioning all these things you're trying to achieve, breathe more efficiently. And uh, the goal is to rewire your brain to think. How do you practice that? How exactly, what exercises, how long do you practice? What, what are the expectations? How do you structure? So I'm going to uh, dig into the specifics again. If you feel like something, uh, something is uh, uh, counterproductive mentioning, because uh, uh, I assume we established that there are different cases and um, the symptoms vary. And I would assume that the, the, um, the path you take to cure the problem varies a little bit. But what exercises were you doing? Uh, how, I assume it's not necessarily the exercise, but the approach to the exercise uh, uh, that, that matters a little bit more. Can you uh, elaborate yeah. a little bit more on that? Yeah, so I can tell you a bit about what what my prescription has been, and Jane calls it a prescription. So every time I see her, she says, okay, go do these exercises and I'll see you again in two or three weeks. Um, but yeah, to repeat the disclaimer that I have no idea what she's doing with other people, although I assume there's some similarities. Um, so uh, if, if for anyone listening who thinks they have dystonia, what you should not do is say, oh, well, Ross Cohen said to do this, so I'm gonna go do that and fix it because I, I have no idea how to apply these to people with various conditions. Um, but in, <clears throat> In a nutshell, a lot of a lot of what I do involves either blowing through the mouthpiece, blowing into the lead pipe, and or blowing through a straw, believe it or not, the straw being like a surrogate for the horn, because the, the instrument being a stimulus, right? What you can't do is just hold the instrument with your mouthpiece and go, okay, try to think about this differently, because this is it's too much of a stimulus. So um, you have to establish new habits without the stimulus on some other object, and then um, again, in an extremely meticulous and clinical way, Jan has a process for, you know, do this exercise for five, you know, blow through the mouthpiece for five minutes and blow through the lead pipe and then blow through the mouthpiece and the lead pipe and sort of combining all these different things in a very, very specific pattern. Um, and and sh uh, I don't always understand exactly how she's approaching things. Some of it I'm sure she deliberately doesn't tell me about until after the fact maybe but the the idea that i'm establishing new habits on a different object and then trying to transfer them to the instrument and so um my practice time could be depending on what she is prescribing to me 
you know, it could be, you know, anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour to do two or three times a day, um, de depending. But it's it's very, very meticulous exercises. And in Agridas, what you said is correct. It could be that sometimes I'm doing exactly the same exercise, but now I'm focused on something totally different, which is getting, again, establishing new habits. It could be that I'm focused on on the air going into the lead pipe. It could be that I'm focused on the air at the end of the lead pipe. It could be uh, any any number of things. It could be I'm focused on my respiratory function. Um, so it, there, there, there's not only the exercises that I do, but what my brain is focused on as I do that. Um, and uh, yeah, be, beyond that, I don't know how to specify more for other people because I can I know only what what my prescription is. Now, you, you mentioned, for example, I'm, I'm going to, uh, again, uh, uh, go into the specific ex example you gave me, uh, blowing through a straw. So you're blowing through a straw, and are you trying to replicate, uh, remember what the, what the sensation you, you was getting and then replicate that into, into the instrument? Or wh how, how is that helping you? Can you, can you explain me how, how that specific uh, exercise is helping you? Basically, what what you just said, it could be any number of things that I'm focused on, but but you know, to to just practice playing on the instrument, which has been the stimulus for this dystonic function, I can't do. So, but by so the straw just be, the straw is basically an instrument, right? It becomes almost like a a pretend instrument in that in in that regard for that for that purpose. Okay. And uh, and you were uh, so uh, unfortunately, obviously, <laughs> our concert series finished <laughs> due to the lockdown, so uh, we're kind of on hold. But the last series that you did was the first series you came back after uh, almost a year of a layoff. It was close to a year, and um... no, it was uh, it was the fall series. So oh, fall series, yeah, okay. yeah, September through December, um, I took off, and then we're off in January, February, anyway. So um, I came back in March after. I guess six months or so, five or six months worth mm -hmm. of, of training. Mm -hmm. um, and that was good for me to do. It was a lot of my new habits held up. Um, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't perfect yet. I still have retraining to do, but I, um, you know, and it, it was all in consultation with, with Jan, is how, you know, how much time I took off and when I was ready to go back. Um, and that was actually helpful for me because it was a relief to know that a lot of the retraining I did and the new habits and the new function and, all that stuff held up in the band, you know, it didn't, uh, I mean, I, I was pretty confident, but there was always something in the back of my head that said that could have just come unraveled, you know, at the first rehearsal and I was back to square one, but that did not happen. Um, and one thing I thought was telling in terms of learning to play efficiently was that, you know, after taking all that time off from the band, I was, I was not in what most brass players would call, you know, most of us would call brass band shape. You know, it's not like I had been playing two hours a day and doing all these concerts and blah, blah, blah. I was doing a lot of practicing, obviously, but not the type of playing that is involved in playing in the band. Um, and one thing that did not happen to me is that my, I didn't get tired after the rehearsals of the concert. So fatigue or, you know, I, I didn't feel out of shape at all. So after taking all that time off from the band and, and, uh, practicing in small amounts at home without playing with other human beings. When I came back, I could go through a two hour brass band concert. And at the end of the show, my embouchure was not tired that, you know, that, that was not an issue for me. So that was, that was very reassuring um, that the work I had, I had done was, was sinking in. Yeah. Mike. Ross. Yeah. Um, I had another question as you, as you were talking, um, whenever you were doing your recovery, and you were mentioning about, you know, just working with your mouthpiece and, and trying to do a, a redirection with, uh, with uh, working on the straw. Did, did you find yourself through most of your recovery, especially early on, were you sort of casting the horn aside for the most part and, and trying to do it through other methods with the straw or, or just the mouthpiece? I'm wondering... You know, how much time did you spend with the horn? You, you're, you're, the, the person who was helping you seemed to make it sort of seem like the horn could cause you to get back into those same behaviors that you're trying to stop. Did you spend a lot of time away from the horn, and then towards the end of your recovery, you start to add it back in? or No, the, the horn has always been involved. 
but it may not be involved in every exercise in my routine. So it's sort of like, um, and again, I just followed exactly what Jan had told me to do minute by minute. And it, it's, so I might spend five minutes with just a straw or just a mouthpiece and then another five minutes with just a lead pipe and then transfer that to the horn and start playing on the horn. So there's, again, I, I don't pretend to understand or have her expertise in terms of how to get your brain to start to establish a habit and then transfer it to the horn, which, which was a stimulus, but that's, that's the gist of it is you have to kind of teach away and then apply to the horn teach away and then apply to the horn. But that is totally her area. I, I, I could never have come up with this process on my own and I still couldn't write my own prescription right now. And I know at, at certain points, you know, the exercises she has me do, you know, some of it is meant specifically to address my corners, trying to get them to move back forward and stop pulling. Some of it is specifically to address my airflow and and my breathing some of it is to address my other things and so um she has again a clinical way to address that that i don't i don't pretend to have expertise in or, or know what her master plan is even even for me you know of course sometimes she'll tell me okay we're gonna we're gonna address this now we're gonna address this but i, I also know that she has a a plan that i'm um you know she doesn't always divulge to me for good reason, just like we do with our students, right? You could, you know, be addressing something by moving their focus of attention to, to something else. So, um, but it, yeah, it's, it's establishing a new habit on a different object or without the object and then moving it back to the horn. Yeah. And it's interesting. I'll, I'll see if I can, I can get a hold of it. You obviously introduced, um, uh, you introduced uh, us. I'll see if I can get her on one of these uh, streams so she maybe could uh, get into the more uh, specific things that uh, uh, that are outside your case. I I'm just curious, uh, how, how did she, and that's probably a question I should be asking her, I guess, but I'm wondering, how, did she just, because uh, for, for my European uh, uh, followers, uh, University of North, North Texas is, is uh, one of the main universities uh, yeah. inside the country. It's a, it's a big one. And um, uh, I, would, I don't know her story and background outside of that, but uh, I guess uh, most people don't just go like, oh, okay, I'm going to quit my job at the best university and become a specialist on focal dystonia. So I'm just curious, yeah. how, how did that, uh, did she suffer from the uh, same issue or? Uh, or uh? She, uh, no, she has not had focal dystonia. So I, I will I will leave it to her to explain how okay. or why she got into this this expertise and this again the the neurological understanding of of playing an instrument that I've not really I've not fully heard from other other teachers um, and uh, you know she she didn't leave the teaching to become an expert she was an expert while she was there so I know people used to go and you know visit her uh, or you know they they would fly to to Texas to get. Um, to get help from her um, and luckily now people are able to do that on online so I you know I don't I don't really know the answer to those questions okay. you could you'd have to okay. her. and uh, I think we're gonna go to some of the questions because I'm seeing a uh, pretty uh, good questions that are actually related now I put a handle um, in case people want to get in touch with you and ask <laughs> some questions again I, I, I kind of have some idea of uh, of how I would approach it, but again, I, I would not claim I'm a, I'm an expert. So at this point, you have firsthand expertise. So I put your handle. You use Facebook. If people would like to find you, the name is on the screen. If if you, I'm sure you can figure that out from that point. So, but please, I'll say please, you know, please go ahead and reach out to me. And not that I'm going to help you through retraining, um, because again, I don't I don't pretend to have the expertise. Um, but if, if you're feeling like you're having some of these symptoms and just want to ask some questions or want to know, you know, who to get in touch with to help, by all means, send me a note and, you know, let's talk about it. Okay. So, um, I've seen, a, a, a few, a few messages from a gentleman by the name of Steven and, um, uh, as far, let me just read them through so we get a better idea. Uh, f uh, for me, it, uh, Stephen says, for me, I started airballing certain notes, uh, the easy ones on the staff, but I could still play the more difficult high and low notes. 
And uh, as you were speaking uh, and describing your situation, he said, yes, same pitch as me, same identical pitch. And uh, my dystonia slowly affected me over four years until this January when I had to give up principal euphonium and move to a doubled up baritone part. And um, the question was, is the matter of changing, is it a matter of changing your ambassador? Uh, and uh, also uh, the main problem, uh, uh, is there a hope to fix this for someone who doesn't feel they can uh, spend thousands of dollars to fix uh, this uh, issue at the same point? Because I would assume um, hiring, uh, especially for this specific topic, even though uh, in your case, you, you, your career, a part of your career is playing and you make money. So obviously for you, uh, an investment uh, to, to, to hire a specialist is a fantastic idea. But um, are there any alternatives, uh, at least in your mind, um, uh, where uh, somebody could uh, find or, or, or gain information obviously they can reach out to you now so that that would be uh, that would be one way uh, so if yeah. Steven is still watching but uh, again the question was is it a matter of changing your ambassador and I guess the, you kind of answered that in a way that it's, it's more of a rewiring your brain I guess uh, but it, I mean your your ambassador at least mine does wind up changing but it's not in the way that you know i think a lot of brass players may have to go through either a wholesale embouchure change at some point in their career or just kind of tweaking it but again it's be because this is such a specific neurological condition where the it's that the motor signal is broken so it's not a matter of and i went through an embouchure change in college unrelated to this you know 15 years ago more than 15 years ago, but it's not a matter of like, okay, well, I've been playing upstream. Now I'm going to try to play downstream or I'm going to move. I'm going to try to move the mouthpiece and be more centered, or I'm going to try to pivot this way or that way. It's not a thing that you can just do and then get used to it. It's that you no longer have control of the muscle. So it's, it's, it's not something that you can take a couple bits of advice and say, Oh, I'm just going to try playing this way now. Like you're, you, you can't control the muscles. Here. Yeah, you're basically saying that you have no power to control what is taking place because of the involuntary response that's happening with that. So yeah. by retraining in different methods and different ways, you could help to correct that that issue. I'm, I'm starting to really gain a lot from 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 what you're saying. At first, I, I really had no idea uh, about this uh, this condition and, and things like that. But you, you're making uh, you're making a lot of sense to me with with uh, the, the the conversation that, that you're having. Now, put your, uh, Ross, put yourself in in the shoes. Let's say you're you're a, a 16 year old kid in a high school, and uh, basically you're watching this chat, and everything you're talking about matches like 100 percent. Like in terms of sin, what do you do? Like, what would you? Uh, obviously, you probably won't go to your parents saying, "Hey, I, I need, uh, I need five or three or four or two thousands or a thousand, thousand. Or maybe you go. I don't know. Depends. On what, yeah. But I mean, I, I think, uh, it, yeah. I mean, whether you're a student or whether you know you you're playing just for fun, there is, I mean, there there is a dedication and a time commitment to fixing this, right? And so I guess you have to decide, is that something that you have the time to do? Um, and, uh, you know, I, uh, I don't know, I don't know what to say about the, the finances. I guess people have to decide, you know, whether for this or something else, like, you know, do, do you want to, you know, spend money on, on a, on a teacher, but there is, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess people have to, for me, it's worth putting a year into this, right. To, to go through this kind of methodical practice. Cause yeah, hopefully I can do this for the next you know, 40 years of my life. If, if you're a 16 year old in high school and you have no aspirations of playing beyond high school anyway, I, you know, I don't know because it's not a quick fix. If you're in high school and you want to major in music and you want to go on with this, then that, that may be, you know, an investment you need to make in your, in your career. So I guess people would, make those decisions for themselves and, and those uh, so where i'm heading with this you mentioned some names and some articles is there information that uh, people can uh, and uh, just not necessarily finding all the specific information but just just a uh, general guidelines of understanding this and again we're going to link some of that but uh, you you mentioned a couple of names do you have like a, a specific list of uh, of names or articles did you read any books uh, or or I 
articles that, that Jan directed me towards, but um, it, neither one of them were specifically about focal dystonia, right? They were both from um, one woman was an Alexander Technique teacher, right? And Alexander Technique can be applied to uh, lots of professions. It could be applied to athletes. I, I saw an article um, that my uh, my teacher here in Pittsburgh, Katie Palumbo, who's done a great job for anyone who's here in, in Pittsburgh, is a, a great piano player and singer and friend of mine. Um, but <clears throat> I saw she posted an article once about how, you know, Alexander Technique had been used to help surgeons, right, mm -hmm. who spend their careers, like, you know, standing on a, a table with their arms up like this, doing these tiny motions. And if they if they start to feel fatigue or stress, right, Alexander Technique was a way in which they could learn just their posture and their motions to be easier. So um, those articles I referenced were not about dystonia at all. And in fact, were not even about musicians, but they were about, um, you know, how, basic body movement and kinesiology in, in general. So they're, they're helpful to read because they apply here, but they're not a path forward to retraining or fixing the problem in and of themselves. Now, now uh, the, 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 the question that, uh, that I was reading, uh, it has a follow-up. A person is, uh, is actually naming a specific doctor he went to in Toronto and the amount of money he spent uh, and uh, no no results with that he's mentioning so i'm just curious uh, with um, with your experience w were there any um, guarantees or expectations or timelines or like how are you aware of what's the what's the success rate for recovery or is is it something that as long as you're willing to spend time enough time whether it's a year half a year two years three years you will recover or what's what's the worst case scenario like uh how bad does it go and uh, um and uh what would be a, a recovery rate is there is that something you're you're familiar with or or not exactly not really that i'd feel because i don't i don't even know a ballpark so to be honest with you i i don't know i mean i i so i i feel like i'm i'm beyond the halfway point right I'm on the other side of this, I think, um, and it's been uh, seven or eight months for me. Um, that, that's about as much as I can say. I don't think. Yeah, I, I to be honest, I don't I don't want to answer that inaccurately. Okay. So I would, you know, the best thing, you know, reach out to someone, send, you know, send some emails and see if if whether it's Jan or another teacher. Um, and there are other teachers who. Um, who address musicians dystonia could be for other instruments but I, you know i don't know uh, many of them um i don't know any of their names but you know reach out to someone and 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 get that feedback from them i, I don't want to venture a guess as to that okay uh there's a there's a super chat coming from nathan thank you very much nathan he's saying it's like a party in here so <laughs> that's good okay ben uh, ben uh, is asking uh, let me just see if this is a message well basically i'm just going to read it through hey all euphonium player here with focal dystonia this is an issue i've been dealing with for just over three years my symptoms include mild tremors in the lips and surrounding muscles it also happens when I try to whistle or drink from small uh, mouth containers like bottles. As an active duty army musician, it's been tough. Like this gentleman, I can do enough to get by with no complaints from my fellow musicians, but my tone, range, and endur uh, endurance uh, have taken a big hit since college days. I've managed to not worsen the initial symptoms in the last couple of years with some adjustments. I'm always on the lookout for information regarding fo focal dystonia. So thank you for the stream. That's uh, that's just a nice feedback. So, yeah, sure. Good, yeah. And I uh, appreciate Good. appreciate you uh, appreciate you sharing this because uh, again, not not a lot of people are willing uh, are willing to share this information. So let yeah, me sure. let me let me just go through some more chats. We're gonna have to wrap this up soon because it's been over an hour. And um, if we get more follow up, we might as well just bring uh, bring you here for one more of these streams uh, or if something you feel like uh, we haven't mentioned. But I think we went in, into pretty good detail about uh, how this works. So um, I'm seeing a lot of beard comments. Uh, what, what is happening <laughs> there? I, I I think they're referring to yeah. you two guys. <laughs> I'm on my phone. I'm just making some comments as we go here. Those were for me. Okay. Now, Ross, I'm going to I'm gonna ask you to give some shout-outs, uh, Ross and Mike. Uh, say hello to Ellen. Oh, hi, Ellen. Ellen is the best. She's, all, she's <laughs> always on. She's oh, all thanks, thanks for listening, Ellen. Okay. Say hello to Mark. <laughs> What's up, Mark? 
Okay, that's some good stuff. People are asking for shout outs. Um, now uh, I'm getting some non-focal dystonia questions, uh, and I, I know we were uh, we we're primarily going to focus on that, but uh, uh, Ross uh, mentioned that he does not mind answering a few a uh, few non-related <laughs> questions since we've been answering high register questions for like ten streams uh, in a row. <laughs> I might as well pick your brain. Uh, how can I try and make TM uh, TMEA for state-like tone and keep my air going? <laughs> <laughs> now this is a very specific question so how do Wait, you improve say how do you more, say, say one more time okay so i'm question. not gonna i'm gonna uh, basically the question is how do you improve your tone to 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 go to all state for tmea like how do you get tone apart what, what would be your best tone building advice ross Oh, uh, that's almost, it's hard to say at this point is my, <laughs> I know it's hard. Concern. That's, that's why we <laughs> have you here. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, listen to great examples, you know, practice consistently and, and uh, do all of those things. There's no great way to answer that. I will say, cause I, as a middle school teacher, I, I get this question from my students sometimes. I'll say, well, how can I make first chair? How can I win this audition? How can I do that? And then there, there's two answers, right? One is all the list of things you can do. You can take lessons. If you're not taking lessons with someone, you can do these exercises, blah, 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 blah. But the other answer to that is there's nothing you can do to ensure that you're going to make TNA or get the principal in, you know, first chair, clarinet or flute in your band because you can't control how the other people play. So all you can do is play as best you can and then hope for the best results. But you can, you know... Could be there's a crop of, you know, 50 other world-class euphonium players in Texas that year and you don't get in. Or it could be that it's a down year for euphoniums and you get in. But to, Just move to, answer, to a different you know, state. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I, I tell students that, too. They're so, uh, I wanted to be first chair. I'm only second chair. So, well, look, you could be first chair. But then if some whiz kid from another state moved into town, they take first chair. And, you know, like you, you have to kind of worry about you, but not worry so much about your rankings or audition success as a as a student because you can't control that top top three things name top three things top three most important things in your personal opinion that will determine your success in the all state auditions or any auditions for the matter name three qualities i know there's a bunch of them but top three just just give it give us a shot putting you on a spot good tone mm-hmm Good rhythm. And good intonation. Good, good musician. Well, it, yeah. It just, <laughs> ah, musicianship. Well, you skipped intonation. How, how dare yeah, you? That's, I, I didn't want to. Yeah. yeah. In time, in tone. You know, uh, uh, in, in time, in tune with a good sound. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't want to leave off the musicianship yep. part. Yep. But, Mike? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I take it, think of it a little bit different. Uh, confidence, uh, adaptability. You know, uh, uh, an audition and, and things like that. There's a lot of things that could go one way or another. Free, so you're, free no. things. Stop free things. <laughs> you, you, thought, you thought you're gonna get away. <laughs> confidence, adaptability, and intonation. Music, musical skill. <laughs> confidence, adaptability, musical, musical skill. Can, can can I say something about the person who had the question about the tone? The the one thing that I would say about that. Would, would be uh, to see if this person, I'm not sure what the person's name is. Uh, I can't remember from what you said before, but uh, for the person to listen to their tone and see if they can notice any issues with what they might be, why they might think that their tone is not where they want it to be. Like, what are some of the qualities of that sound that you're hearing that you don't like? What don't you like about that? And then if you can narrow it down to some issues that are happening, then you can start to correct some of those issues. Like could uh, working with the breathing exercises or how you bring in air or blow into your instrument. Is it stuff with tension somewhere? We talked about Alexander technique quite a bit tonight is is there tension someplace in some of your muscles or throat or lips or something like that that are, that are causing the tone to to happen not just how can i get a, a great tone that that's really tough to determine but you could determine if you're having issues with your tone what don't you like about it and then you can narrow it down from there with specific exercises to to get better 
Okay, let's take one more one more question, which is again uh, back to the topic. W when is it too late? Um, Mark is asking, when is it too late to fix focal dystonia? Is there any any point to where to where um, again? I, I don't know whether you'd be you'd be comfortable with uh, with uh, giving some uh, opinions on that. But is there a point, and what would be the point? And you mentioned that uh, you you caught this pretty early. Um, what would be, uh, do you know what's the difference between early, middle stage and, uh, and kind of game over type of stage? Um, not specifically. I don't know if there is a game over type of stage, but I, I will say that the nature of this, or like we all know, because, you know, we're, we're all teaching physical habits. The longer you do a particular habit, the harder it is to learn a, a different habit or to replace that habit. So the sooner, the better, um, and so again, I this started to pop up for me in March of last year. I went to Jan at the uh, middle end of August, and she said that I kind of caught the early stages of this. Um, I suppose people could go on for much longer, you know, hoping it's not that, or trying to get help, uh, trying to get other forms of help that that wasn't successful. So I don't, I don't know. I, hopefully, there's not a point of no return. Um, but you know, the, the sooner, the sooner, the better. Uh, sometimes when I play, I have involuntary vocal cord engagement. Is that a form of dystonia? I don't know. I have never specifically heard of that as a symptom, but I, I don't know. Um, uh, Marcus is saying it's tough to climb back. It's down to the player and determination to get back. Um, now, uh, the last question I'm going to ask you, and we're going to wrap this up. Um, if you had to judge, uh, you said you you're on the on the other half, uh, meaning you're you're probably your assessment would be you're you're close to recovery. How close? Uh, also, like I don't know again if that's something uh, you're aware of, but is 100% full recovery is that uh, is that um, something that happens, or is it always something that you'll have to at least uh, to some extent uh, uh, deal with no i i uh a hundred percent does happen i i know other people who have or i know of people who have recovered a hundred percent um I, there are people who i guess have not been able to recover i think there are people who get close i guess it did i i don't know how to answer what would lead to one outcome or the other um other than, I guess, at some point, it depends on how much time you're willing to keep putting into this, um, which for some people might be, might be determined by what what role this plays in your life. You know, again, if you're if you're a full time musician in a military band or a major symphony orchestra or, or brass band or whatever the case is, like you're gonna and you're spent you're gonna do this for the next 30, 40, 50 years of your life. Like you're gonna keep scrapping until this goes away if if you feel like you're still making progress. If if you're doing this again more as a hobby, you might make some progress, and then you know at a certain point say, okay, that you know that that's where I need to be. So I, I think there would be a lot of factors that would determine that. Um, uh, but the, the the goal, my in my expectation is is full full recovery. Okay, uh, I know I mentioned last question five questions uh, ago, but. <laughs> How 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 do uh, how do I distinguish? Uh, and these are not questions I'm asking, but these are the questions I'm reading off the chat. How do I distinguish um, a cortically based dystonia from muscular issues or poor uh, technique? My tongue uh, has always been heavy and hard to control. Um, uh, I'm practicing a lot on tonguing, but maybe it's uh, cortical. Is there is there a good way? Uh, is there a way to determine whether that's uh, how? How did how did the uh, how do you know? Again, um, you kind of mentioned that it, it, it's based case to case, but I know focal dystonia. Again, it's uh, we're talking about brass player related focal dystonia, but it's overall condition. It does not necessarily have to be uh, 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 brass playing related. So I would assume that could happen to your tongue movement as well. How how do you know? Like, is there a good way outside of? Uh, Outside of maybe content uh, uh, contacting a specialist, uh, anything you would you'd advise? I I I don't know. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what what did you describe? The question was: Is it dystonia based, or what? What was the other or, description or of poor the... technique or muscular issues? 
Oh, how do you how do you disturb how do you determine neurological versus muscular? Uh, uh, did you notice how I'm trying to slur that word just because I'm not pronouncing it? I'm just neuro. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that uh, that I think you would have to see a specialist. If, I mean, if it's a motor, or, I'm sorry, if it's a, a, a some kind of muscle disorder unrelated to playing, then I don't want to venture a guess as to that. If it's if it's poor technique, right? So if If a teacher can go to you and say, hey, try doing something else and you can start to adjust, then again, the, if something is dystonia, it, you have lost control of it, right? There's some action going on that is involuntary. You you cannot change it. You can't just try something else. It's it's gone. So I don't know if that would be a symptom or not. I should mention that what, what I did see as I was trying to Google this in the early stages, I know some people would go to, instead of a music teacher and instead of going to Jan or someone like that, they would go to a neurologist, right? Because an act, you know, a doctor, a neurologist would, they would know of this condition, this vocal dystonia that could, it could happen in other professions or it could be attached to other things, you know, unrelated to music. Um, and again, in a very, very limited pool of, of um, examples, I guess the, the problem could be that a neurologist doesn't know trombone technique or brass playing technique. So they might be able to diagnose the problem, but they may or may not know how to fix it because they're not familiar with the action that we're doing. And if you went to a regular music teacher, they might not know about the dystonia part. So it, it kind of takes a specialist to understand both of those things to, to guide you through recovery. Um, but if you think you're having a muscle condition, get that checked out by somebody, you know, not, not me. Uh, I'm, I'm getting a few more messages. Uh, um, we're we're going to have to wrap this up soon because this is going uh, longer than I anticipated, but I'm, I'm getting some um, good amount of messages. A, a person by the name of Mark is just sharing, um, sharing a story. Uh, I've written an article about my recovery in a student and it's been published by a brass band, wor uh, brass band world. Uh, and uh, he's suggesting to link that article. Uh, Mark, Marcus, uh, link it in the comment section. I'm going to put that in, in, uh, in, in the group as well so people can find a little bit more resources because I think that would be helpful. And um, he also mentions that, um, that his theory is that uh, it's uh, a prolonged, uh, prolonged playing and uh, playing too much, using too much pressure and uh, just basically practicing for too long. Do you think that has an impact? Uh, so... It, it could. There's any number of things, and it, it's hard to tell what what would set that off. It, so practicing too long or just playing for too long could lead to something like that. If 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 your if there is some sort of imperfection or inefficiency or imbalance in your mechanics, right? So it could be that you know none of us are doing all of our you know breathing and buzzing and whatever like perfectly, but you're doing it well enough to get by. But if you do that for too long, it right, or if suddenly there's some kind of change in your playing environment, right? Suddenly you have some like a huge recital coming up or like a, a really strenuous concert, maybe you change equipment and now suddenly the way that your mechanics pair with the equipment aren't matching and that could that could trigger a dystonia. It could be, you know, you have a new conductor who wants, you know, everyone in the orchestra to play twice as loud and you're so It could be any number of things I gather that could that could trigger that, right? Like thing, whatever imperfection you have, you can make that work for so long or in a certain environment. But if that environment changes, right, and your mechanics can't uh, can't adapt to that, then that could trigger a. a so, so you would say that it's not necessarily to do with the length; is more of a incorrect incorrect practice. So would that be a fair thing to say? I my understanding is it it would both would be likely right if you're if you're playing very efficiently and there's you know you're breathing efficiently and your your but your tone production mechanism whether it's buzzing or otherwise if that's easy and efficient you can play as long as you want to and you're not doing any damage if there's some inefficiency the more work you do the more that becomes a problem so for instance an athlete right if you you have some injury, you could maybe finish out the second half of a game, but maybe you're not going to play a whole season like that, or you would like, you would really cause a worse injury. You know, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm still seeing, I'm still, I'm seeing people share, share their experiences. That, that's interesting. And, and, um, somebody, uh, well, it's, 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 I think it's the same gentleman who asked one of the longer questions as well. Um, I'm, and he's mentioning that he was able to track, 
down to the very day this 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 was started was that a process uh, that you went through is tracking the timeline i know you said you mentioned where do you think uh, when do, do you think that happened but was that something uh, that was discussed in your lessons trying to determine when exactly that happened or is just more that hey it, it, it is the situation right now it happened over time let's get let's get that fixed yeah we didn't track when i mean i explained to jan that exactly what i did at the beginning of this interview is that it did uh, the f just kind of started feeling it was really flat it just felt a little funny and then spread so i couldn't i couldn't tell you the particular day i could pinpoint probably to within a few weeks um and then again it took probably some weeks or a month after that to spread to where it had set in you know as uh, as much as it did with me and then it just kind of plateaued and continued feeling like that for a few more months i don't think Yeah. I, it, so for me, it was not a case of like, yeah, I had a really long concert. I had to play a high B flat at the end of the night. And then I, I felt a tear in that hurt. It was not, it was not like, there wasn't a moment in which I like pulled a muscle or something like that. That was not my experience. Okay. Well, I think it's going to be a time to wrap this up again. If you have any more questions, leave them in the comment section below. Or if you'd like to share your experience, I think I'm going to try and get Jan on, on, on one of these, if uh, she will be willing to, to come out. And if you, if you have uh, more questions for Ross, leave them and I will make sure to bring him uh, uh, on one more of these live streams. Or maybe if you remember something uh, that uh, you feel I forgot to ask, or you forgot to mention a anything else you would like to add or that you feel that uh, I didn't bring up or, um, not not specifically i mean i think you asked good questions i i kind of presented the information as comfortably as i could and as yeah. much as i knew that i thought would be helpful um and but just the main thing is you know th this is a thing that is out there and while a lot of people need to be confidential about it or kind of secretive like there i i think it, it happens more often than we know so if you think you're if you think you're having these issues reach out to me or somebody for help and again not that i'll help but i can point you in the right direction but it, sure. it's um, i i hope it's been helpful to get some information out there even if it's just my own experience mike any anything you'd like to you like to add or i, I just wanted to say to ross you know thanks for sharing your journey uh, sure. with us um it's it's uh it's nice to see that uh, you're making progress with this i know uh both al and myself we were really missing you there in the, in the band for uh, for a long time there, and it was nice to get a series uh, back with you. And hope that we can get back again uh, after after you know the current conditions are. For all this, yeah. yeah. Hey, thanks, Rob, man. I, I appreciate that. It was it was great to come back, even just for a month. And uh, yeah, I, I appreciate the encouragement and support. And uh, likewise, Al Gadas, and thanks for asking me on to to talk about these things. I think it was a great idea. Sure, and thanks a lot for coming. And thank you to everyone who's been watching. Again, uh, you can see it on the screen. Ross Cohen, get in touch with him if you have any questions on Facebook uh, um, or reach out to me. I'll direct, uh, I'll direct you to him as well. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to share, like, subscribe. We would highly appreciate that. And with that being said, have a great rest of the weekend and I will see you all on our regular uh, video on Monday. Take care, everyone.